Good afternoon. This is the last mini lecture for Summer A 2019. We're going to talk about galaxies and what the galaxies tell us. The nearest galaxy to us is called M31, the Great Spiral Nebula in Andromeda. And you can actually see the nucleus of it uh, with your naked eye in the summer uh, if it's a clear night, but it's kind of hard to see. Uh, now, what is a galaxy? How are galaxies held together, for instance? Well, galaxies are held together by gravity, and they're the next larger size organization of objects um, above solar systems. So, for instance, gravitation binds um, a star system's constituents. You know, it's, it's star, it's planets, it's uh, asteroids, comets, and so forth. Now, a galaxy is also gravitationally bound, but it doesn't have a central star. It, it appears to have a, most of them appear to have a black hole in the center. That's a little bit different from a star. But it's, it's all bound gravitationally, and they're orbiting and so forth, in different planes and different speeds and so forth, just like the planets in our solar system. So that's kind of the, the uh, organizational makeup of galaxies. Let's take a look at the shape of the Milky Way. The first person to figure out the shape of the Milky Way, other than the fact that it stretches across the sky as kind of a band, uh, was Herschel. Um, back in 1785, he basically did a bunch of counting. You can read about it in chapter 25-3. Um, his first approximation was, was here. Um, and that's not bad because he could only see out to about 6,000 light years. And the galaxy is about 16 times larger than that. But, you know, his idea was that somewhere in, um, in you know, that the, the galaxy did have a flat shape or a, the shape, perhaps a shape of a wheel. Now, the authors of the textbook introduced a really great analogy um, uh, to figure out, figuring out the shape um, and the positions and stuff of, of the stars in a galaxy, which was what Herschel was trying to do. And they compare it to um, being a person in the marching band on the field at halftime. And so think of yourself as being out here, you know, so you're one of the band members. And you're looking at different things around you and trying to figure out, you know, the structure of it. Now, it's, it looks pretty easy from this picture here, you know, because we're up above it. But, you know, you, you know, you think of yourself down on the field and you see people up in the stands. Um, you see, you know, this young lady down here out by herself. Um, you see a row of young women um, in a formation uh, that, you, you know, you probably can figure out from the field. And then there's this uh, person up here on the stand. And I have no idea what this guy, it looks like a guy with a beard and a dress on. I'm not really sure if we should ask too many questions about that. But anyways, um, so this is what the, the task is, except for there, there's one thing. This photograph is from a vantage point above the uh, field. Now, here's, your, here's our actual perspective. We're down here on the field. Now, you can still see things up in the stands pretty well, but it's much tougher to see what the structure is of the band's formation uh, on the field. So you, if you're down here on the field, as we are in the Milky Way, uh, in the plane of the Milky Way, it's a little bit tougher to figure out the stuff in the Milky Way. I mean, you can could, you could figure out that it's all in a plane, but exactly how it's all distributed, much tougher. Okay. And so it's a significant uh, detective mystery, really, trying to put it all together. Now, about 1918, Harlow Shapley figured out um, that the fact that, that there was a uh, you know, roughly spherical distribution of globular clusters of stars, uh, which you can read about in the book, of course. This is figure three from chapter 25. Um, and this is about 133 years later. And he said, you know, look, we've got these globular clusters. We know how far away they are, where they are. And they seem to indicate that, this, that 
the sun is not in the center of this distribution of globular clusters. It's kind of off to the side. And it's a lot bigger. And so he, he figured, all right, whatever else the Milky Way is, it's a lot bigger. And it's also the center of it is somewhere in the constellation Sagittarius. So here's your pull quote from chapter 25.1. He found that the clusters are distributed in a spherical volume, which has its center not at the sun, but at a distant point along the Milky Way in the direction of Sagittarius. Now, that was a good guess. I mean, that was, you know, because we now know that that's where it is. You know, our big galactic black hole, Sagittarius A star, is down there um, behind the constellation Sagittarius. So. Now, let's take a look at what we currently know about our galaxy. You know, Harlow Sha Herschel and then Harlow Shapley and a bunch of other guys figure, have since figured out a lot of stuff. Here's a basic, basic, basic diagram of what we know. Spherical halo of globular clusters and really old stars, uh, quite a bit bigger than the disk. The disk itself has a thin disk with a lot of stars and then a thicker disk, but not so many stars in it. Uh, but definitely a disk shape. Then there's the bulge in the center, the galactic center. We now know there's a black hole in there. And guess what? The sun's definitely not in the center of anything. It's kind of out there, you know, kind of out on the edge, but not quite to the edge. Uh, and so we're just out here in a kind of a generic position, nothing special about it. Now, the thing about it is we can still figure out the sun's orbital velocity around the center of the galaxy. And so we know what its period is, and we can figure out the approximate semi-major axis uh, of the orbit of, you know, the, of the sun around the galaxy, the, the so-called galactic year. And for that reason, we can use uh, good old Kepler's law to figure out the mass uh, of the galaxy. And the problem with that is when we do that, it leads us into some trouble. Now let's look at what we've got. Kepler's third law, you know, we apply it to, you know, satellites, moons, planets, the sun. Everything works out really good. You can figure out the mass. We use it for binary stars. You can figure out the mass of binary stars. Um, if you, and that's for um, objects that are, you know, like discrete objects, like a pair of objects. Now, the, the sun is orbiting the center of the galaxy. But the galaxy is not a discrete object down there at the center. I mean, it is orbiting SGR A star, but it's orbiting everything else. And the way that you figure that out using calculus and stuff is you say, all right, let me think of the sun as orbiting um, a spherical distribution uh, of matter. Uh, and, 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 and what, what Newton's... Uh, laws of calculus and his, you know, law of universal gravitation and everything say is that all you have to do to um, figure out the, the mass that drives the sun is to consider only the mass inside of the sun's orbit. So stuff way out past, you know, all stuff out by the halo stuff. If there's not a lot of it, you can ignore it. Now it's, there, it turns out there's quite a bit out there, and we can't ignore it. But this is the first approximation, your most basic approximation, the spherical distribution of matter inside the sun's orbit. So what, what Newton says is, look, if you do that and you do all the calculus and stuff, which we're not going to do, but we're going to talk about the result. The result is the laws of motion you know, Newton's laws of motion and everything, act as if all the matter inward of the, sun, of the sun's orbit is concentrated at a point in the center of the galaxy. So what that does is it, it makes it a lot like a planet orbiting a star or the sun orbiting that big blob of mass, but now concentrated at the center of the um, of the galaxy. In other words, this uh, spherical mass in the, in the center, the sun's orbiting it, and that's approximately what's happening. And 
you can't distinguish that orbit from the one on the right where you have the same amount of mass but all concentrated down at the center of the of the galaxy they're equivalent the, the laws of calculus says use this it's easier so why not all right so that's what we do and when we do that you know with the sun and with other stars we can figure out um, you know how much mass is inside of each star's orbit all right and from that we can you know figure out all right everything so many uh, million light or so many thousand light years from the center of the galaxy should have a certain speed okay and then you you know factor in all right this the galaxy is not quite a sphere it's got spirals but you 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 use a similar method for that now what we're looking at here is a sphere and that's a pretty good approximation especially towards the center of the so the uh, galaxy uh, but here's what the fancy looking theory is all right uh, so what you do is you you make some your model and then you try to verify by observation all right so let's go out to five uh, kiloparsecs that's right here and then we you know we figure all right the the velocity is going to be up here um right about here and we go out and observe it and yeah it, it matches up to our theory and then we go out here to 10 kiloparsecs we measure the velocity of stars out there and yeah we're we're, we're good you know the theory we get it's got a little bit of wiggle in it but our observations match the theory now out here at 15 kiloparsecs you start to run into a little bit of a discrepancy because here's the theory the theory is on the blue line and it now starts to break away from the data because the data the observations they're up here a little bit faster and so the the model you know based on kepler's third law and, and you know the spherical approximation and all that stuff says we should start you know once we're outside the main part of the galaxy our velocity should start dipping downwards that's what the blue line says but our observations say we're a little bit high over here you know 15 kiloparsecs you got a little you know it's 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 concerning and you keep measuring so here's 30 out here at 30 kiloparsecs you got some real trouble because that's a big gap you know the observed up there on the red line and then the theoretical value it should have down there on the blue and a big gap um something else is going on because According to Professor Galileo's principles, observations rule. Um, and you can't, you know, your theory is nice until you make some observations. And if your observations conflict with your theory, guess what, guess what gets uh, ditched? The theory. So something else is going on with this. And that's, you know, that's something else. That trouble is called uh, dark matter. So let's take a look at, at that. Now, here's a nice pull quote from chapter 25.3 about the mass of the galaxy. Studies of the motions of the most remote globular clusters, so way, way out there, and the small galaxies even further out that orbit our own, like these two over here. These are the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, you can see them in the southern hemisphere. And they're not very big galaxies, but they are galaxies. And they're interacting with our galaxy. And they're and they're interacting with the Andromeda galaxy. You know, we're all kind of in there uh, orbiting around and stuff and interacting. Uh, but when you study those, you know, the remote globular clusters and the small galaxies that orbit our own, they show that the total mass of the galaxy is way bigger, 2 times 10 to the 12 uh, masses of the, of the sun. That's uh, 2 trillion solar masses and that's about 20 times greater than the amount of luminous matter so the matter that we can see you know that's that blue line i mean it you know it's it's way less than what the velocities show us so we got some some big trouble and but it, and it's incontrovertible you know we call it dark matter There's something in there that's that's you know, keeping things in orbit at very high speeds, a lot higher. You know, so like Neptune is out there way far out in the solar system, way far away from the sun. 
so far away from the sun, it's slow. Earth's orbit, way faster, because it's closer to the sun, okay? Now, that's what we should have in the solar system, in the uh, in the galaxy, but we don't. We get big, big velocities far out where they should be slow, and that's trouble, okay? And we call that trouble dark matter. And we don't know what dark matter is. I mean, we can see its effect on the velocity, the orbital velocities of stars and globular clusters and, you know, the dwarf galaxies outside of our own. Uh, but we don't know what it is yet. You know, no, neither do the Russians. Nobody knows. Yeah, but we know what it's not. It, you know, here's a few things that it's not. It's not cool hydrogen gas. You know, you can't see much of it. It's out there, but, it, it, you know, it's... You know, that model doesn't work. There's not enough gas to do that. It's not lots of little planets, you know, kind of out there on their own, you know, maybe ejected from their solar system. And so they're wandering around out there in space. We know that that's not true. And it's not a lot of black holes or neutron stars. Now, they're pretty, you know, they can have some mass and they don't um, have a lot of luminosity necessarily, although sometimes neutron stars do. Uh, but we know it's not that. And uh, the reason we know that is because we should see um, black holes um, and neutron stars doing some what we call gravitational lensing, bending starlight. So the stars behind those, if they were there, they would bend the starlight uh, from the stars even further out um, and we'd be able to pick it up, but we don't. Uh, so gravitational lensing rules that out. Now, one of the things I'm an expert at is boson stars. That's basically uh, one kind of a boson star is basically a big sphere of light that's gravitating uh, not by its mass, but by its pure energy, uh, which is theoretically uh, possible. But it's not dark matter. We know that's uh, the case. So we still, you know, it's a big question mark. All right. We're still working on it. Here's a nice picture. Uh, and this is from uh, several um, observations, Hubble Space Telescope and the Chanda X-ray Observatory. Um, the uh, reddish areas here, this is the, the bullet cluster, they call it. And it's a cluster of galaxies. And the reddish areas, that's false color for X-rays. So there's a lot of X-rays coming from that area where it's kind of reddish pink. And uh, that, they think that's from hot gases, so so hot that they emit a lot of X-rays. Now, the blue areas are where they figure there's a lot of dark matter. And how do they know? Because the background galaxies behind this cluster, you know, the even teenier ones in the background, they get lensed. They get gravitationally lensed into, you know, kind of deformed shapes, you know, arcs. And some of them turn into, um, you know, kind of blobs instead of a nice spiral. And uh, so we can see that and measure it and figure, all right, there's got to be a lot of dark matter there because it's acting like a big lens. It's deforming the light rays from those background galaxies. All right, so we can see the presence of it, but we still are, we're basically clueless. We, we don't know what it is. You know, there's all kinds of theories, but we can't, we can't nail anything down yet, but we're working on it. All right. So that's our, you know, some of the problems with our galaxies and other galaxies. It's, it's a lot of trouble. Now, I want to cover what Edward Hubble uh, found in the spectral lines of the galaxies that he looked at. Now, he was looking at galaxies mm, about 100 years ago and, and around in that era, the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And uh, he looked at a lot of uh, galaxies and what he what he found was that there's a pattern in the spectral lines. Now, let's take a look at this. Uh, so here's a star field. It's actually a galactic field. Everything labeled NGC is actually a galaxy. Now, one of the uh, galaxies that he studied uh, was NGC 379 because uh, he had a particularly good uh, spectrum for that. That's in the constellation Pisces. It's about 195.5 million light years away, we now know. Anyway, uh, so what Hubble and his assistant, Milton Hugh Mason, did, uh, so they studied as many as they could, and they used the luminosity of Cepheid variables, and that gave them the distance to the galaxy. And then what they did 
was they um, took the spectral lines, especially the H and K lines of calcium. Now the H and K lines of calcium are purpley blue lines way down here in the purples. All right, they're almost in the ultraviolet. Okay, and you know Hubble, you know they also measured the shapes and stuff, and and uh, what they found was a pattern in the redshift of the H and K lines of calcium because those um, calcium absorption lines, like you know this picture of the sun spectrum, everything that looks is a, is like a gap, a dark, a, a black gap. That means that that color is absorbed from the spectrum of the sun by the, the sun's atmosphere. And so those little dark gaps show us, you know, if you analyze all those absorption features and you figure out, all right, we got some calcium, we got some neon, we got some hydrogen, we got helium. That's how they discovered helium, you know, by looking at lines that didn't match up with any other element in the spectrum of the sun. Anyway, so H and K for ionized calcium are down here in the purples. And there's some other lines for uh, calcium. Here's a bunch. Um, uh, the H and the K, they're at, uh, the K is 393.4 nanometers wavelength, and H is a little bit bigger, 396.8 um, nanometers. And they're two of the more intense lines of ionized calcium. You know, this is from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. And they list all the, uh, the wavelengths of calcium. Uh, and so, for instance, the 318.1 nanometer line, that's, that's definitely ultraviolet. That's, it has a relative intensity of 700. H and K, much more intense. They have a relative intensity of 1,000. And then 657.3 line, that's in the reds. Uh, that's got an intensity of 500, a relative intensity. So uh, that's not quite as strong. But H and K, definitely strong. And so, you know, the guys at NIST and other labs around the Earth, they knew all this stuff, you know, back in the 1800s uh, for pure calcium. And so, uh, you know, we gradually make better and better um, measurements of those wavelengths and stuff. Anyways, these are the wavelengths. And just to remind you, uh, a nanometer is a bit one times 10 to the minus nine meters. That's a billionth of a meter. So the wavelengths of uh, visible light uh, are pretty small. And in fact, Roy G. Biv uh, visible light is from 700 nanometers, uh, and that's red, down to 400 nanometers or so, and that's violet. And so these are these are dipped a little bit. Uh, below 400, so they're considered visible, I guess, but um, a little bit lower than that, and they're and you're definitely talking ultraviolet that you can't pick up with the human eye. Anyway, uh, let's go and take a look at what Hubble actually found. So here's over here on the left is a set of photographic images that he took. Now these are black and white photos. They didn't have color film yet. All right, now we're going to analyze these photos. Because there's a pattern. And these photos show a pattern in the redshift uh, of the H and K lines of uh, calcium. All right, so let's take a look at these in close up view. All right, this central shape here to the left, that's, if this were color film, that would be the rainbow. All right, and you see those two gaps over there towards the far left? Those are the H and the K lines. Those are the, the color is missing. And so if if this was a, a, a these are actually photographic neg negatives. Okay, so you're looking at the negative. All right. So if this was a regular photograph in color, you'd have a regular rainbow there. And then down there in the purples, you'd have little black gaps that, where you don't see any light. And this is a negative. So those black gaps in the negative show up as white um, gaps. All right. And here's, you know, here's the next one. This is uh, NGC 4473, another galaxy. And uh, you can still see the H and K line gaps. And you, you see that it's, it takes the shape of almost like an airplane wing. And what that means is that the colors down towards the violet end 
are not as bright and where the airplane wing is thickest uh that is uh where it's it's also brightest by the way these are black and white photos so the vertical stripes on each one you know you can see it above and below those are actually reference lines it's kind of like a straight edge uh, but it's a color straight edge so uh, they use the color spectrum of helium uh, so they can they can judge all right this is the lab value for helium and you know I know where the H and K lines are relative to helium and so they can figure out where the H and K lines go and you can see that that little arrow there um, above the airplane wing on the left side that's the shift the, the, K, the H and K lines have moved all right let's go to the next one all right this one's an airplane wing but it's a little bit dimmer and you can see the arrow is a little bit bigger now let's go down to the next one Ooh, we got a big arrow here it's a big shift all right and uh the last one down here really dim and a really big shift arrow all right so it's really dim so um this really thin airplane wing it's almost like a straight line almost indicates that this galaxy is really faint all right and they know the distance because they use Cepheid variable stars to get the distance so they know how far away it is roughly and this one up here is oops let me go through this again sorry here we go. okay so this one's faint and this one appears a little this is the brightest one of this set all right now the other thing and just to reinforce those arrows uh, right above the airplane wing um, they point to the H and K lines of calcium and the amount that these lines are displaced to the red end of the spectrum right so you can see that you know the red end is over to the right the purple end is to the left and those gaps those um, openings for H and K keep getting further and further away from the left side you know the leftmost so the leftmost line of the uh, vertical stripes for helium uh, the spectrum of helium uh, your H and K in the, in the lower image is way far away from the, the leftmost stripe but in the upper image the top image it's still fairly close because it's a smaller frequency and, and wavelength shift all right now here's NGC 379 now we're going to calculate this redshift I'm going to show you how to do it right now you're not going to have to do this on the test but I want you to see it just so you you know for general edification all right so here's the gaps okay now this one and then here's the next one you know and there the second one's more like a dimming out the first one it, it definitely is a gap all right and okay there's the first one and that's the k gap and then here is the h so the h absorption gap or the h absorption feature uh, for calcium ionized calcium and so you take this photo you know probably several nights to get a good image here and then you in the lab you do your trig and your you know your uh, pythagorean theorem you figure out all right the wavelength of that h line is actually 404.2 nanometers if it's coming from ngc 379 now down in the lab you know that the h is 396.8 nanometers make the nist will tell you that and any good lab will tell you that so we got we got a shift here it's a wavelength shift all right so the way that we do this you know we get this measurement from the spectra and then we compute this um quotient delta lambda over lambda now lambda in the denominator is the lab wavelength so that's going to be 396.8 and delta is going to be the measurement 404.2 nanometers minus the lab wavelength so that's going to look like this so there's your numerator 404.2 nanometers minus the lab wavelength all divided by the lab wavelength so this is like a percentage uh, wavelength shift all right 
and so this one here 396.8 that's from the lab all right now you calculate that out and you can do this on your calculator you can verify this with me if you do it carefully uh, you get 0 0.018606 and that is the red shift uh, we give it the symbol Z uh, for NGC 379 and what that means, you know, in terms of wavelength, that means you have about 1.8% shift, okay? And that's not a big, huge shift. You know, there's lots of galaxies we have big red shifts for. But this one, yeah, we can measure it. You know, you, we have a good good telescope and, you know, good protractors and, and good, you know, straight edges and stuff. And, you know, you can get that, that wavelength down pretty good. So 404.2, that's, that's not too bad. We can definitely measure that. Now, the theory of relativity says, all right, you get your, your percentage wavelength shift, Z, the red shift. And if it's 0 0.018606, that means that the speed is 5.5 .5 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. And it's, you know, 5,500 meters per second or... 3,400 miles per second. And 3,400 miles per second is what um, uh, Hubble has in this uh, image. He's got it kind of written in by hand uh, down there below the, uh, the actual spectrum for NGC 379. And now they estimated in those days the distance was 23 million light years. Now we now, we now know it's a lot bigger than that because, you know, there were some uh, some uh, modifications to the data and stuff like that. But anyways, this is what he found. He he took this, he did, you know, H uh, spectral line shift, and he did the Ks, and he did it for a bunch of galaxies. And here's what it looks like. This is his original diagram from the his book, The Realm of the Nebulae. Um, and the uh, NGC 379 is pretty close to the origin it's uh, in the lower left uh, but he mapped these out and it looks like there's almost a straight line relationship between distance and speed and they're mo they're all red shifting so they're moving away the further away you are the further to the right the faster you're moving the further up so it's sloping up to the right and this is the profound relationship um, that uh, Hubble was, you know, stupefied, you know, by finding, you know, nobody expected this, you know, but there it is. I mean, the, the data are pretty clear and it's a little bit rough uh, in this view, uh, but it's definitely, he, he felt very good about making this conjecture. You know, it's not, you know, it's uh, it was the first try, and he felt confident uh, making this uh, guess uh, that it was, you know, either the dark line or the dashed line. And he had reasons for, you know, kind of saying, well, it might be the dashed line and stuff. And you, if you check that book out from the library, you'll be able to read about it. Now, he only went out to about uh, 2 million parsecs. That's about 6.5 million light years. All right, and that's pretty good. There's a lot of galaxies out that way. So he got a bunch of them. Now, you know, and, and what get, and what Hubble was using was Cepheid variable stars, and those are good, but you can't see them way, way out. The thing that you can see way, way out is the Type 1a supernova. All right, now here's a more modern uh, graph. It's a Hubble diagram. This one's using... Uh, type 1a supernova. This one's from 2004, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Robert P. Kirshner. And you can see this one goes out to about 700 megaparsecs, right? So that's 2.3 billion light years, right? So these galaxies uh, are 2.3 billion light years away, or at least one of them is anyways. And so what that means is uh, the light took 2.3 billion light years uh, to get to us. So what we're seeing when we look at that galaxy is the state of the of the galaxy 2.3 billion years ago. Now our 
solar system we think is about 4.6 billion light years. So that's half the age of the uh, of the solar system, right? And we've got even more data than that. But for type one super type one a supernova uh, detonations, this is uh, this is pretty good. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Dr. B, what's that little red splotch down there? Yeah, that's a big question. That little red splotch down there, you know what that is? That's this. That's Hubble's initial diagram. Yeah. So uh, he only went out to a few million parsecs. Uh, let's put it in scale now. His original and the and, uh, and Dr. Kirshner's uh, 2004 plot. Here we go. There's your shrink down. So down here, that's Hubble's <laughs> that's Hubble's initial data way down there, a little teeny set. And now using these supernova, we got a huge amount of volume of the universe, and we're we're keep we're compiling more data as we go. So this is a huge amount of uh, progress, and um, you know all the all the guys that were working on this Vesto Slifer, Milton Hugh Mason, Edwin Hubble. Boy, they would be dancing in the streets if they could see this diagram. All right. What does it all mean? Why are we going through this stuff? Well, one of the things that it means is that our universe is expanding, and it's expanding everywhere. And the best um, analogy that I've, I've seen over the years to describe the expansion of the universe. I mean, we know that things are moving away from us now, and so therefore uh, we think that they have been expanding for a long, long time, all right? And the way to think about that is if you took um, a balloon and you uh, put pennies, you, you uh, glued some pennies or you glued some uh little uh, stars or sparkles, you know, what do they call those things, the sparkly stuff that you put put on uh, on Christmas cards and stuff. Okay, you put some of those on the surface of the balloon, and then you blow the balloon up. Now, the balloon blowing up is, um, is like the universe expanding. And if you have two pennies or two uh, blobs of glitter, uh, that are like an inch apart, and then you blow up the balloon, they might be an inch and a half apart, all right? So those, they're both receding from each other. And that's what we think the universe is doing. Now, there's a huge amount of uh, calculus and, and geometry behind that theory. That's called the Big Bang Theory, the expansion of the universe. But we, fit, we, know, we know it's, we, we've, we've got a fairly good handle on that. And we kind of have a good idea of how that works. Um, and so the, the, the thing about it, however, is, all right, the universe is expanding. So if you run the clock backwards, it must have started, you know, a certain number of billion years ago at zero volume, right? So if you run the movie backwards, um, it'll shrink, 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 shrink down to zip zap, right? Now that indescribable beginning is what we call the Big Bang. And uh, the Big Bang theory rose from basically this uh, discovery of the expanding universe. Now, that's a whole other story. I know all about the Big Bang theory, and it's kind of a cool theory. Uh, but it's basically this, you know, the a few balloons to the left here, and you're back to a smaller universe, and just keep going. And eventually, you've got this indescribably small, compact, very dense and very high temperature universe, and that's what we call the Big Bang. And the interesting thing about it, the laws of physics at that temperature uh, and in that compact space, all of matter, all the protons and neutrons and quarks that go into your eyeglasses, your Mountain Dew, your cell phone, the chair you're sitting on, every carbon uh, atom in your body, 
uh, all that matter and all the energy in the universe uh, didn't behave like particles, you know, with a mass and everything. They beha it behaved like light. The entire universe acted as if it was were light. And so different laws of physics, uh, but we know those laws of physics, and we, we can model it. But we can't model it all the way down to the very beginning. So that initial Big Bang moment, when the universe was light itself, um, has been expanding. And as it expands, um, all that light that didn't form matter uh, also redshifted. So the light from galaxies is redshifting. And all the light from the Big Bang that didn't get turned into atoms and electrons and stuff like that uh, has been filling the gas that has been filling the universe ever since. We call it the photon gas, and that photon gas has been redshifting. So all these little red squiggles you see, kind of floating around out in space, that's like the leftover from the Big Bang, right? And now it's redshifted. Um, it's it's past red. It's all the way down in the uh, in the microwave band now. All that light left over from the Big Bang. It's kind of a beautiful theory to think about. Now, we've talked about the Big Bang now. We've talked about galaxies and stars that make up galaxies. And what does it all mean? You know, we've been, we've even talked about um, comets and how comets and the debris in a comet can sometimes be traced back to um, a distant red giant star, you know, billions of years ago. And we've talked about Galileo and how Galileo and Copernicus, Kepler and Newton, all figured out all, all the rules that we still follow. You know, for instance, your observations have veto power over a theory. That's Galileo. And that's Galileo talking. It's 400 years later, but he's still the BOSS. He's the, uh, he's the professor. He's the main professor where all his students, even Sir Isaac Newton and those cats. So what does all this mean? Among other things, it means of all the stuff that we've studied, it means we still have a lot to learn. You know, we're sitting in this big, wide universe. We can see all kinds of stuff. We're surrounded by galaxies and stars, comets and asteroids, dark matter, dark energy, uh, that we're still, we're still trying to figure out a lot of it. And then, of course, the biggest mystery of them all is the mystery of life, the symphony of life. That's another mystery. It's not astronomy that's going to figure that one out, probably. But that's another good mystery to think of. 